blazing house fire illuminates cold-blooded homicide and has possibly destroyed all evidence leading to the killer. It looked like a suicide. Now investigators aren't so sure. The clues are unusual, but do they add up to murder? A killer tries to steer investigators down the wrong road. Can forensics get them back on course? To solve a case, authorities have to know who to trust. That can be a challenge when key players bear false witness. At 6.37 a.m. on August 2, 1992, the Evansville, Indiana fire station sprang into action at the report of a burning house. A woman was trapped inside. Intense heat foiled their rescue attempts. The billowing smoke became impenetrable. It was thickest in the bedroom, where the victim was purported to be. The fierce blaze was quickly extinguished, but too late. They couldn't save her. Any loss of life is tragic, but this one struck a personal note with some of the officers on the scene. The call had been made by Evansville police officer Patrick Bradford, who had stopped by the house after his shift and noticed the smoke. The house belonged to 24-year-old Tammy Lohr. Now she was dead. Lohr worked as a civilian jailer for the county. She dreamed of a life in law enforcement and hope to one day become a police officer. All right, what we got was where the, the body was on the bed. Once the fire was extinguished and the victim removed, the investigators the walked through the house to see what might have caused it. Uh, they're examining that, they got To Evansville fire investigator Jesse Story, the evidence led to one conclusion. We were able to determine that the fire was uh, suspicious in nature very early on. Uh, after we made an initial walk through of the building and had determined there were some burn patterns in the carpet that, that were suspicious and uh, very much uh, similar to those produced when a liquid accelerant is poured on the floor. And what they did as they, as they, as he, as he came out... The fire burned a trail on the carpet leading from the bed to the bedroom door. A gasoline can still stood at the epicenter of the blaze. Carpet samples were collected to confirm the presence of the accelerant. Investigators found other signs of foul play. An electrical engineer determined that circuit breakers to the bedroom had been switched off at the box, not tripped by an electrical problem caused by the fire. The phone lines had been cut and shorted together. Anyone calling would have heard a busy signal. And the scuttle hole cover, the hatch leading to the attic, was lying on the floor just outside the bedroom. Soot deposits revealed it had been removed prior to the blaze. Evansville Police Department crime scene investigator Michael Ford witnessed the result. It was obvious the fire that came out of the room vented through the scuttle cover just right outside the bedroom door, which would have helped vent the fire and let the fire burn a little bit more. It would have taken the fire into the attic and created a more extensive burn on the house. 
A smoke detector collected from the scene was missing its battery. Did y'all guys check the window? Yeah, well, you guys didn't cut this out. As the know. investigators finished with the bedroom area, they looked at the rest of the house. In the kitchen, they found the window propped open with one of the victim's rings. And the screen had been cut. They presumed this was the murderer's entry point. But they weren't entirely certain. For one thing, it was small and not easily accessible. This is the exact size and everything of the kitchen window. And the, one of the unique things about it was right below this window at a level about right here, there was a kitchen sink. And on the back of the kitchen sink were several items that had someone come in through this window would have been knocked over. There were some pots and pans that would have made a substantial amount of noise by someone coming through the window. Investigators also noted that if this were a break-in, right, right the motive here. wasn't clear. Nothing appeared to have been stolen. Attention focused on the window, the alleged point of entry. Something wasn't right about it. In fact, working with a model of the window, investigators determined that whoever cut the screen wasn't breaking in, but breaking out. Based on the angle of the slash through the screen, Ford believed that it most likely had been cut from the inside. And indicating that a right-handed person would have had to almost cut the screen from the inside, leaning over the counter, because the screen goes from a lower area on the right-hand side to a higher area on the left-hand side, indicating that a right-handed person would have been more than likely to make that pattern from the inside as opposed to the outside. While investigators pondered the clues, Officer Bradford drove himself to the police station to answer questions about what he saw before he reported the fire. Because Bradford had entered the burning house and was the last person near the body, as part of standard procedure, he handed over his uniform so it could be tested. Investigators hoped it would yield evidence that might have otherwise been destroyed by the flames in the house. Patrick Bradford told investigators that the victim was his mistress. He'd last seen her around 10 the previous night on his way to work. When he finished his shift around 6.30 a.m., he stopped by. As he pulled down the street, he saw smoke billowing out of her house. He said he rushed into the burning building, dropped to his knees, and crawled to the bedroom door where he saw the bed engulfed in flames. He couldn't find Tammy. That's when he radioed for help. Because the break-in looked staged, investigators suspected that Lore might have known her killer and opened the door to him or her. Bradford suggested that Evansville police detective Guy Minnis talk to one of Lore's former co-workers. Patrick told us that Tammy had some problems with another jailer uh, that used to work in the jail with her. And the day that the body was discovered, that was one of the first people that we interviewed. Lore had once reported her colleague for making sexual comments and using excessive force on the prisoners. It cost him his job and earned Tammy Lore a sworn enemy. He claimed he was home all night and didn't get out of bed until after 7 that morning. His wife vouched for him. And uh, when I interviewed him, I felt that he was being honest. And I was also looking for his wife's reactions because she was kind of standing in the background as I was talking to him. And when he told us where he was and who he was with, uh, I didn't get any kind of reactions from her. We were running south on Bakey. By now, the major physical clues to the case had been gathered. Still, police had no real suspects and no clear-cut well motive. Black eye rock. But yeah. their next yeah, clue well would come well from the there. victim herself.
Evansville fire investigators were certain that the fire that destroyed Tammy Lohr's house was intentionally set. But the fire had also apparently destroyed all clues leading to who set it and why. Then the autopsy provided some surprising information. Tammy Lohr hadn't died in the fire. She had been stabbed 21 times and had no smoke in her lungs. She had been murdered before the arson. The fire was apparently an effort to hide blatant homicide. The murder was revealed, but investigator Ford thought the murderer might have succeeded in obliterating his identity. As far as fiber type evidence and things like that, because of the fire, we knew that uh, a lot of that evidence was going to be destroyed. Unfortunately, we would not be able to do the vacuumings of the floor, um, the search of the bed clothes for uh, hair and fiber of a perpetrator, that was going to be destroyed. We can take and open this up and test it. Police hoped that Officer Bradford's uniform might hold some clues the fire destroyed. At the lab, Jesse Story analyzed the uniform for traces of accelerant. Petroleum-based hydrocarbon accelerants are, by their nature, highly volatile. The hydrocarbon detector is sensitively calibrated to electronically sniff for the chemicals as they evaporate. It can detect flammable molecules on the order of one part per million. Investigators found no trace of the accelerant on Bradford's uniform. That made sense. He said he crawled into the house and stopped at the bedroom door. The accelerant had been confined to the bedroom, so Bradford wouldn't have picked any up on his clothes. Tests on the bedroom carpet confirmed that it was saturated with it. In the lab, fibers clinging to Bradford's uniform were compared to fibers taken from the victim's home. Bradford's uniform had not a single fiber on it from the house. That was peculiar, considering he said he'd crawled through the home to save Tammy. If Bradford really did crawl across the carpet, he would have had to pick up fibers. Bradford's story started to fray. Investigators felt that he and his wife Dawn might know more than they were admitting. Authorities knew that Bradford had been seeing Lore behind his wife's back for four years. The affair showed no sign of ending anytime soon. Dawn, who suspected her husband's infidelity, might have seen fit to kill his mistress. That was a theory that was popular amongst many citizens here in Evansville. They thought that Dawn killed Tammy and that Patrick set the fire to cover up the murder that his wife had committed. Polygraphs were ordered for Patrick and Dawn Bradford. The test measures the changes in heart rate, respiration, and blood pressure that often occur when a person isn't telling the truth. Dawn passed the lie detector test, showing no prior knowledge of the crime, and was cleared as a suspect. Patrick's results were deemed inconclusive. Another test was scheduled for the following week. Police continued to gather interviews to get a clearer picture of what happened at Tammy Lohr's house. Okay, maybe you'd like to talk with him. Sure do. Hi, Mr. Trey. I'm just have a seat over here at my desk. Over here. Her neighbor said that Bradford, apparently distracted, almost ran into him pulling into the driveway that morning. They greeted each other. Bradford didn't seem frantic, and the neighbor said he didn't see any smoke. Other witnesses said they drove by the house that morning, saw Bradford's car in the driveway, and also didn't see smoke. By the time the fire engines arrived, three minutes, 40 seconds after Bradford made the call, the fire had ravaged the bedroom. Based on the type of fire it was, a mattress doused in gasoline, 
investigators knew that it burned fast and created blinding amounts of smoke. It couldn't have been on fire long prior to Officer Bradford's arrival. But the larger question was, did it actually start after he arrived? Evansville fire investigator Jesse Story, for one, thought Bradford's statement about his rescue attempt was just a smokescreen. His description was that he saw flames six to 12 inches high and, and the tips breaking off uh, whenever he got to the bedroom door uh, was, was not very feasible to us because we knew what the heat and smoke conditions were uh, whenever accelerant is used in a, in a compartmentalized area such as this bedroom. Uh, and it was our contention that had he got that far inside the house, that, that he definitely would have been overcome by smoke if not killed. Determining if Bradford had actually set the fire required a down-to-the-second reconstruction of the events that morning. In order to prove Bradford had time to burn the house, Minnis began to create a detailed timeline of the suspect's activity. He realized Bradford would have had to drive past an ATM on his way to Tammy Lohr's house. Its camera faced the street. Detective Minnis requested a copy of the ATM tape for the morning of the fire. Sure enough, it showed Bradford's car driving in the direction of Lohr's house at 6.34 a.m. Sixty-five seconds later, he called the fire department. Minnis, stopwatch in hand, retraced Bradford's route. It took him only 18 seconds to go from the ATM to the victim's house. When I drove the route, I found that Bradford could commit the crime of arson in the 65 seconds that he had, from the time that he drove by the ATM until the time that he called in the fire on his walkie-talkie. He had plenty of time to pour out the gasoline, set it on fire, and then, and then call the fire in. But arson was only part of the story. He couldn't have had enough time to kill Tammy Lohr, tamper with the electricity and phone, stage a break-in, and then set the fire. That part of the story had yet to be told. Investigators hoped that Patrick Bradford would tell it. He kept his appointment for his second polygraph test and was asked questions specific to the staging of the scene. He denied involvement. He failed. The sergeant and I both interviewed Patrick Bradford at that time once we knew that he had failed the polygraph test. And that's when I knew for certain that we had the right guy. Now, investigators had to prove it. The current timeline didn't allow enough time for Bradford to murder Tammy. They reasoned that just because the fire was started in the morning didn't mean that that was when the murder took place. The condition of the body made time of death impossible to determine. But Tammy had spoken to her father on the phone at 10.30 the night before the fire. So she was murdered between then and 6.30 the next morning. Investigators looked into Officer Bradford's timesheets the night before the fire. They found one gap in his report. Shortly before 11 p.m., he radioed in that he needed to run some errands. Then there was a break of about an hour when he could not be accounted for. Patrick, of course, told us that he never went by the house at any, any point in time during that evening, other than when he was going to work in his personal car and he stopped by to see Tammy for a few minutes. Then he continued on to uh, work and, and got his police car. Working with this new time frame, detectives went back to their files. They re-interviewed neighbors about what they might have seen. One woman was driving above the speed limit through the neighborhood and saw a police cruiser parked at the victim's house. She checked her speed and slowed down. It was around 11 p.m. Come on, guys. Yeah, well, we're here. No, 
Evansville investigators have now placed Bradford at the house the night before and proved he had enough time to commit murder. They felt they'd gathered enough evidence against one of their own. Officer Patrick Bradford was arrested for the murder of Tammy Lore. As for motive, lately Bradford and Lore were having difficulties. Police surmised that on the night of August 1st, the two had an argument that was settled by murder. The passerby had placed Bradford at the scene, and his logbook showed he had the opportunity. He returned to the house the following morning, as was his habit. Only this was to be the last time. He finished what he'd started, pouring the gasoline and striking the match. Patrick Bradford was convicted of murder and arson. He was sentenced to 80 years. Murders, like clandestine love affairs, require an elaborate deception. But that level of deceit can seldom bear close scrutiny. It's easy to see how a place like Farmville gets its name. The little community of about 6,000 people, nestled in the rolling hills of central Virginia, retains its rural charm in a fast-paced world. But even a quiet town like this is not immune to tragedy. On December 11, 1991, just after 1 p.m., Farmville police received a call about a shooting at the home of Robert Bruce. Detective Jack Bryant was dispatched to the scene. Though shootings are uncommon here, this one wasn't totally unexpected. I was driving on South Main Street. I received a call, radio call from the dispatcher to go to 600 High Street. There had been a shooting. And my immediate reaction was that Mr. Bruce had shot himself because he was scheduled for sentencing on an embezzlement charge. Farmville police began the case with an assumption, Bob? an assumption that proved wrong the instant Robert Bruce answered the door. They were surprised to find that Robert Bruce wasn't the victim. They were even more surprised to learn that it was his wife, Carol, who had apparently committed suicide. Robert Bruce told detectives that he and Carol had an argument that morning. He took their children to school, returned to the house for a brief period, and then left to go to an appointment at the bank. When he returned home, he found her dead. Carol Bruce lay on the sofa in the den, a bullet to her head. Any crime scene, even a suicide, must be thoroughly documented. Before anything was touched or moved, every inch was photographed and measured. The room was much warmer than the rest of the house, and the victim was covered with an afghan. A 32 caliber Colt revolver lay on the carpet. The victim's hand was thrust awkwardly into a gardening glove. Though it appeared to be a suicide, these details raised doubts in Detective Bryant's mind. And the glove was just partially on the hand. It wasn't on a hand as someone would normally put a glove on. Investigators compiled a growing list of troubling details. They noted that the gun was more than two feet from the victim's trigger hand, and that the overheated room would change the body temperature and thwart attempts to gauge an accurate time of death. It all seemed too suspicious. Detectives began to doubt that Carol Bruce took her own life. They feared 
she might have had help. In Farmville, Virginia, as Detective Bryant investigated the mysterious death of Carol Bruce, he began to suspect that she had been murdered. To prove it, he started with the gun. A trace of the serial number revealed that it was local. He went to talk with the owner. It had been reported stolen to Detective Bryant five months earlier, taken out of a car in the Bruce's neighborhood. The owner made no secret of the fact that he kept the gun in his vehicle. But he had no idea how it ended up in Carol Bruce's hand. At the morgue, the medical examiner confirmed that the victim was killed by a single bullet to the brain. It entered the right temple and lodged in the lower left portion of her head. But the autopsy couldn't explain who fired it. The initial results of the autopsy was that it was a routine suicide. And the department did not actually make a ruling on it. The chief left that to me to do. And any time that I was contacted about it, I just said it's, it has not been ruled a suicide or a homicide is still under investigation. The gun and the slug retrieved from the victim's skull were sent to the Virginia State Crime Lab. There, the gun was test fired. The water chamber stops the bullet without adding extraneous marks. Usually, that allows investigators to compare the test-fired bullet with ones at a crime scene. But in this case, the lands and grooves of the crime scene bullet were too faint to be read. As a formality, investigators examined the cartridge casing taken from the scene with one test fired in the lab. By comparing the markings on the two casings, technicians determined that the fatal shot was fired from the weapon found near the victim. Less certain was who fired it. Detective Bryant had some doubts. Bryant wasn't alone in his suspicions. I appreciate you coming in. Carol's friends had told him that even though Carol and Robert were having marital problems, she was excited about planning her future. Carol taught physical education at the local college and was preparing to earn her doctorate. Then, three days before she was scheduled to take her graduate school exam, she was found dead. Carol's friends also told Bryant that the idea she shot herself seemed unlikely. She was petrified of any type of gun. She just didn't allow them in the house. So that was another thing I couldn't believe. Number one, I couldn't believe that she would have stolen it to begin with. And number two, I could certainly that she would not have killed herself with it. There had been no sign of an intruder in the house. So if it wasn't suicide, the most logical suspect was Robert Bruce, the beneficiary of his wife's $100,000 life insurance policy. You have a lovely day. Bruce had been an attorney, but he'd just been convicted of embezzling $30,000 from his clients and forced to pay restitution. He needed the money. Carol had contacted a divorce attorney to end their 16-year marriage. Her lawyer requested that Robert send him his financial records. but he hadn't filed his taxes for five years. After Carol's death, Robert Bruce was sentenced to several months in jail for embezzling. While he was incarcerated, the death investigation continued. Bryant had established a possible motive, but what of the opportunity? He was determined to get some resolution to this mystery. This case just stayed on my mind all the time. I could wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and this case was on my mind just as strong as it was at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I just, it just stayed with me. I couldn't get it out of my mind, and I knew it had to come to an end somewhere. 
Bryant consulted his notes from Bruce's interview to reconstruct his movements on the morning of his wife's death. The school had a record of him dropping off his kids first thing. Then, Bruce said he puttered around the rental apartments he owned, but nobody saw him there. Then he had a meeting at the bank with an attorney. Investigators spoke with the attorney, who said that he had met with Robert Bruce that morning between 11 o'clock and 12 noon. Bruce left immediately after the meeting. His movements afterward were vouched for by his cousin's wife. She worked in an apparel shop, and Bruce stopped by to chat a while, as he frequently did. He left around 1 o'clock and returned home, where his wife lay dead. As far as his whereabouts for the day, we had roughly from 9 to 11 that he could not actually prove where he was at. All of the other times he had witnesses. That gap could have given Bruce the opportunity to kill his wife. Now, Bryant hoped forensics could prove she had died in that time frame. For help, he contacted Virginia State Medical Examiner Marcella Fierro. But estimating the time of death would be tricky. Time of death is always an estimate. It's an estimate made based on when the person was last reliably seen alive, and the operative word there is reliably, and when the person was found. Although Carol Bruce's body temperature suggested she died shortly before the police arrived, rigor mortis had already begun to set in. That typically takes several hours. It appeared that she was dead for more hours than was reported. In fact, Fierro's time of death estimate correlated with Robert Bruce's window of opportunity. Investigators faced one last challenge. Bruce's motive and opportunity were now firmly established. In order to prove that he pulled the trigger, they had to first prove that the victim couldn't possibly have pulled it herself. At the Virginia Division of Forensic Science in Richmond, Forensic Science Supervisor Ann Davis ran a trigger pull test to see if Carol Bruce, while partially wearing a gardening glove, fired the gun that ended her life. Davis added progressively more weight to the trigger to determine how much pressure the shooter would need to squeeze off a round. Tests determined that it would take at least nine and one quarter pounds of finger pressure to pull the trigger. Hampered by the glove, it would have been difficult, if not impossible, to manage it. After the trigger pull test, firearm and tool mark section chief Jim Pickleman approached the case from another angle. He reconstructed the crime scene based on photos, and he constructed a mannequin and a dummy head to replicate the fatal bullet's trajectory. He found that the angle of the shot would have been too awkward for the victim to manage on her own. And the powder burns indicated that the gun was pushed directly against her head, which wasn't typical. The tests proved that the distance of the gun and the trajectory of the bullet were inconsistent with a self-inflicted wound. Investigators finally had the proof they needed. Carol Bruce did not pull that trigger. In May 1993, Robert Bruce, having served his time for embezzling, was arrested again for murder. Police surmised that on the morning of her death, Carol had fallen asleep on the sofa. Robert came in with the gun stolen several months earlier. He turned up the thermostat to distort time of death estimates. He donned a glove to keep his own hands clean. Then he killed his wife with a single bullet, staged the scene to look like a suicide, covered her with a blanket, and slipped the glove awkwardly onto her hand. The Bruce case represents uh, a special kind of situation in forensic pathology. We call these masquerades. These are deaths where 
what you are seeing is not really what happened and someone is trying to arrange a death to look like a death, a type of death which it is not. Ultimately, Robert Bruce was unmasked by forensics. For his crime, he was sentenced to life. In masquerade deaths, investigators follow the evidence down two trails. One leads to the cause of death. The other, more twisted trail, leads to the killer. Around 10 p.m. on June 12, 1994, police were called to the scene of a car accident on a secluded road in Little Mountain, South Carolina. A woman had apparently driven off the road and crashed. She was dead at the scene. Yet, strangely, her vehicle was barely scratched. Officers of SLED, the South Carolina State Law Enforcement Division, processed the vehicle. They found drops of blood in the back seat, damage to the car's interior, and the gear was in neutral. A footprint on the rear passenger side window suggested a violent struggle. Newberry, South Carolina Sheriff Lee Foster knew this was more than a tragic accident. We noticed that there was absolutely no damage done to the vehicle and certainly nothing that would have uh, caused the blood or the injuries to the, to the body. So all of those um, items in connection, I mean, it was obviously it wasn't a traffic accident. It, it looked like something else had happened. Only after the obvious clues were documented did the investigators search for the driver's identification. She was Victoria Beckham. Authorities had done all they could at the scene. While her family was notified, the victim was removed and the car towed to the SLED laboratory for closer scrutiny. Police notified Stephen Beckham about his wife's death and their suspicions of foul play. He immediately came to the station to answer questions. He said he'd seen Vicky around 6.15 that evening when she dropped the kids off at his house. Vicky was separated from her husband and had moved back in with her parents. She and Stephen shared custody of their three children. Since the separation, she'd gotten a job and was preparing to sue Stephen for full custody. The autopsy confirmed suspicions of foul play. Vicki Beckham was shown to have blunt force trauma to her head and neck. The medical examiner determined that she'd been killed by asphyxiation due to a crushed windpipe. Whatever crushed it left unusual and unrecognizable markings. This was not the kind of injury one would sustain in a car accident. Because her body was already beginning to cool and stiffen when it was discovered at 10 p.m., her time of death was estimated to have been around 6.30, shortly after leaving her husband's house. Stephen Beckham was the last person to have seen her alive. Uh, the investigators narrowed it down to the fact that uh, she delivered the children, he saw her, and uh, we needed to follow up further on that. Because Beckham's house was the last place the victim had been seen alive, officers obtained a warrant to search it. They found nothing but a tennis shoe with what appeared to be a single drop of blood. That wasn't necessarily unusual, unless the blood happened to be from the murder victim. The tennis shoe was sent to the State Law Enforcement Division Forensic Laboratory, where forensic serologist Nancy Scraba tested it. First, she removed the stain with a cotton swab dampened with saline solution. Then she tested the swab by adding phenolphthalein and hydrogen peroxide. The chemical combination reacts with the hemoglobin in blood and turns pink. To prove it was blood, and more specifically human blood, Scraba used a process called crossover electrophoresis which isolated the proteins and revealed them to be human. 
Unfortunately, the sample wasn't large enough to reveal the blood type. The same couldn't be said for the victim's car. Copious blood samples were collected from the front and back seat areas and also from the exterior rear door. All were tested and all were type A, the same as the victims. Forensics had another tool in its arsenal. After the blood, fibers, and other samples were collected, the vehicle was processed for latent fingerprints. Fingerprinting is always the last step because the processes used to reveal latent prints can destroy other evidence. More than 30 prints or partial prints were eventually raised on the car. Many belonged to the Beckhams, some belonged to rescue workers, and most were difficult to read. SLED senior agent David Warren Black knew he had his work cut out for him. They're not the pristine, picture-perfect thing that you would see. They were torqued, they were smeared, they were smudged. They're partial fragmentary impressions. Uh, some may have even been the size, say, of a pencil eraser. And each had to be compared against a database of hundreds and hundreds of known prints. It would take some time. But investigators were encouraged by the discovery of a partial smeared print stamped in blood on the car's exterior. The fact that the print was in blood uh, placed that print being put there after bloodletting occurred. So it could have only gotten placed there after Mrs. Beckham was assaulted. While the print was being analyzed, police returned to the murder scene and stopped motorists to see if anyone driving by on the night of the murder might have witnessed anything. Several reported seeing a gold-colored car parked near the scene earlier that day. Sheriff Lee Foster felt the vehicle could be crucial. The car was an uh, important factor because uh, it could have been involved in the murder or it could have been somebody that witnessed it. None who'd seen it could recall its make, model, or license number. Then, one man pulled over. He'd gotten a good look at it. He said it was definitely a Pontiac. Uh, it was a Pontiac Grand Prix, and it was gold color, and he even went as far as talk about the type of wheels uh, that it had on the car. And he said he knew it was a Pontiac Grand Prix because he had had a car earlier in his life similar to that, uh, just not the same color. And he went on to tell us that the gold color was a very distinctive gold, that he didn't know that, that uh, General Motor made a car that color anymore. A check of motor vehicle records revealed hundreds of Grand Prix, but the database couldn't break them down by color far too many to check. A year passed with few leads and no real suspects. The paper and TV news did follow-up pieces on Vicki Beckham's murder. They focused on the gold car, apparently the only clue, and asked the public for information about it. How are we doing today, Earl? I'm doing all right. The reports jump-started the memory of an acquaintance of Stephen Beckham's. He told detectives that Stephen was a regular at a Myrtle Beach strip club, and a gold Grand Prix was parked in front of the club most of the time. Investigators checked the DMV dead file and found an expired registration for a 1980 Grand Prix that was owned by the proprietor of the strip club. Investigators also checked Beckham's phone records and found that he had made hundreds of calls to pay phones in Myrtle Beach and to the strip club in the weeks prior to the murder. It was time to pay a visit to the owner of the club and bring along a search warrant. The proprietor admitted the car was his, but told investigators that a year earlier he'd loaned it to one of his bouncers, a man named Richard Anderson. The police had the car towed to the lab, 
where they could get a better look at it. The crime happened over a year earlier, and investigators weren't certain this was the car they were looking for. Nevertheless, they combed it for clues. In the trunk, they raised fingerprints that didn't match the owners. Police found the bouncer, Richard Anderson. He agreed to take a polygraph regarding his involvement with the Beckham murder. He denied knowing Beckham or anything about the murder. He failed. Investigators broke the news to him. Anderson uh, decided that he didn't want to cooperate anymore, but would give us uh, hair, blood, and other uh, forensic samples to conduct DNA testing because uh, we were looking into the forensic aspect of the case as well. But on the way to the hospital, Anderson requested that he be taken to the Attorney General's office. He had a confession to make. Richard Anderson, the key suspect in the murder of Vicki Beckham, decided to come clean. His confession revealed he was part of a deadly plan. Anderson told us that he was uh, contracted to kill Vicki Beckham uh, because of uh, uh, the situation that was going on between Stephen and Vicki. Uh, his stories changed from time to time, but it never changed the fact that uh, he was contracted by Stephen Beckham to get rid of the body. Anderson said that the weekend before the murder, he and Beckham met face to face to finalize their plans. Prior to that, they had planned much of the murder through a series of telephone calls at prearranged locations. These locations matched Beckham's phone records. Beckham's plan was to murder Vicki after she came to his house to drop off the kids. She was supposed to be dead when Beckham delivered her to Anderson. But she was merely unconscious after Beckham had pistol whipped her. Anderson was able to describe the gun that Beckham used for the beating. Anderson admitted that after Beckham left, he killed the victim with a bolt cutter, then staged the car accident. At the lab, technicians looked for evidence to prove that Anderson's story was true. Bolt cutters found in his house were analyzed for trace evidence. None was found but the pathologist determined that the fatal injury was consistent with being struck by the tool. Anderson's fingerprints were compared to those found on the Gold Grand Prix and the car where Vicky was found murdered. They matched. Investigators had enough to arrest okay. Stephen Beckham and search his house. When they arrived, he was nowhere to be found. However, they did find a handgun like the one Anderson described. Forensics determined that the marks on the victim's head were consistent with characteristics of the handgun. Investigators had placed Anderson at the scene. They used the phone records to link Beckham to the crime. Stephen Beckham was arrested four days later in Chapin, South Carolina. According to Anderson's statements and what investigators could piece together, Vicki dropped the kids off at Stephen's house. Stephen somehow persuaded her to take a short drive with him. When they got to a secluded, prearranged place, Stephen stopped the vehicle. beat Vicky into unconsciousness, then delivered her to Anderson. But she wasn't dead. When Anderson saw she was alive, he finished the job. Then he staged the accident.
Detective Foster believed that Stephen bitterly resented Vicky's newfound independence and success. He had lost control of her and was in danger of losing his children. To keep his kids, he needed his wife out of the way. He had previously convinced Vicky uh, that she was never going to get custody of the children, but now she realized that that wasn't true. So there was going to be a hard custody battle going on. For the murder of Vicki Beckham, Richard Anderson and Stephen Beckham were convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison. Murderers often believe that they can hide their crimes behind a simple lie. In reality, they're only lying to themselves. The truth is in the evidence, and the evidence is always stacked against the false witness. Thank you.